Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Rock Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 5 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 4 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review. It's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Comron and I know this fantasy series to be the best story ever written, and we're approaching it from a purely fanboy point of view. No critique here for Mr. Erickson. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning. In today's episodes, it may contain descriptions of sorcerous shenanigans and possible violence on <laughs> tables, so it may not be recommended for children. <laughs> Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you, and we really mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, Chapter 5, Part 4. Perrin's eyes blinked open, and he found himself on his knees a half dozen paces from a bemused Anamander Rake. Perrin sensed that but moments had passed since his sudden arrival, yet something of the tension he had first picked up had eased in the interval. A hand rested on his shoulder and he looked up to find Silver Fox standing beside him, the Mibe hovering uncertainly a step behind. Krupp stood nearby while Quick Ben took a step closer to Perrin, though the wizard's eyes held on Rake. Perrin closed his eyes. His mind was spinning. He felt uprooted by his discoveries and thought, starting with myself, master of the deck latest recruit to a war I know nothing about. And now, this. He growled, what in Hood's name is going on here? And talk about disorienting. Teleport from his squad to this location. Teleport in spirit to Finest House. Teleport back after looking at those tiles within the Azath. It's a lot to take in. Oh yeah, that would be, it was quite jarring. <laughs> slipping back and forth from realities that's four teleports because when he was looking at the tiles he went into the tile with the hold of the beasts uh, that's right so yeah he's been all over the place probably not even a five minute chunk of time conversation with race wasn't particularly long silver fox said i drew on power perrin drew a deep breath and thought power oh yes i'm coming to know that feeling genus and rule <laughs> <laughs> he is the one he is the one i'm sorry <laughs> sorry wrong wrong franchise <laughs> We each have begun our own journey, yet you and I, Silver Fox, are destined to arrive at the same place, the Second Gathering. Who, I wonder, will ascend to those two ancient, long-forgotten thrones? Where, dear child, will you lead the Talani Mass? And those thrones were the two that he saw while he was in the Hold of the Beasts. Yeah. Do you think one of those thrones, do you think Silver Fox has designs on that? It's been the first living Talan I'm asked in this length of time? I don't think so, because they okay. didn't worship the Bonecasters. Right. The Bonecasters were, if anything, their connection to that realm. Right. But there were other gods there that they worshipped. That's true. Okay. And those gods just lost all their worshippers, so they either know, don't know what happened to them. <laughs> exactly. A similar situation to Karul, where his power waned because nobody was giving him blood sacrifice or praying to him anymore yeah. so he's gone yeah that's how it goes yeah. and that blood spilling in cruel's belfry in derujistan was one of the reasons he woke up came back that's right okay rake said i had not anticipated such a taut reunion caladan parents had snapped around and found brood and the hammer held so lightly in his massive arms Perrin thought i know you now warlord not that i'll reveal your dark secret what would be the point in that the choice is yours and yours alone. Kill us all or the goddess you serve. Brood, I do not envy the curse of your privilege to choose. Oh, I do not, you poor bastard. Still, what is the price of a broken vow? And that's a good question. Brood seems to handle the responsibility and his choice well, at least outwardly. Yeah, he does carry that very well. And I'm assuming that he was allowed the power of this hammer would be something about his demeanor might have been how he got that too, wouldn't you think? The power of the men here. Yeah, the men hit one. <laughs> the men here. <laughs> Rake continued. My apologies to one and all. As this man, Rake gestured toward Quick Ben, then said, has wisely noted, to act now, knowing so little of the nature of the powers revealed here, would indeed be precipitous. Eyes on Silver Fox, Kalor said, it may already be too late. The child's sorcery was Talon, and it has been a long time since it has been so thoroughly awakened. We are now all of us in peril. 
a combined effort begun immediately might succeed in cutting down this creature. We may never again possess such an opportunity, Rake asked. And should we fail, Kalor? What enemy will we have made for ourselves? At the moment, this child has acted to defend herself, nothing more. Not in inimical stance, is it? You risk too much in a single cast, High King. Brood returned the hammer to its harness and said, Finally, the notion of strategy arrives. The anger remained in his voice, as if he was furious at having to state what to him had been obvious all along. He said, Neutrality remains the soundest course open to us, until the nature of Silver Fox's power reveals itself. We've enough enemies on our plate as it is. Now, enough of the drama, if you please. Welcome back, Rake. No doubt you've information to impart regarding the status of Moonspawn, among other details of note. He faced Perrin with sudden exasperation and asked, Captain, can you not do something about that damned floating table? <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> Flinching at the attention, oh. Perrin stared up at it. He said, well, nothing immediately comes to mind, Warlord. Uh, I'm no mage. Brood grunted and swung away. He said, never mind then. We'll consider it a crass ornament. Quick Ben cleared his throat then said, I might be able to manage something, Warlord, in time. Brood glanced at Dujek, who grinned and nodded his permission to Quick Ben. Rake said, not simply a soldier, I see. Quick Ben shrugged then said, I appreciate challenges, Lord. No guarantee that I'll have any success, mind you. No, do not quest towards me, son of darkness. I value my privacy. Rake said, as you wish, and turned away. I'm surprised Rake let this go. He quested out to Silver Fox, and I assumed if he really wanted to know more about Quick Ben, he would do the same here. I agree. I think part of it, though, is probably, you know, Rake, he is here for diplomacy. One thing, Silver Fox is an unknown, but the Malazans are people we're here to bargain with or talk with. So he might listen just on the fact that be like, I don't want to start anything over this fellow. I know he's something. <laughs> he knows that I know. That's enough. That's all I need. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Maybe after the really tense moment, he's just like, all right, we're not going to get into anything else that's going to escalate the situation. We're in de-escalation yeah. mode. Let's just calm down. Yes. <laughs> okay. Everyone have a drink. Let's go. Let's go have a beer real quick in the tent and chill out for a second. <laughs> Man, that riles some people up. Yeah. Krupp asked, is anyone else hungry? All eyes turned to him. <laughs> he was just gorging himself on sweet cakes, but moments ago, it's been five minutes, maybe. I posit a question to you. Do you think all of this eating, I know the sweating and all the, a lot of this other stuff is, I think all part of an illusion or something. Do you think the eating is part of the illusion? Cause he's, he doesn't seem to ever get bigger as much as this guy's always eat. No, I think it's just one of his affectations. Okay. That's kind of me too. I'm like, uh, is he actually eating or is he holding food in his hand a lot and waving it close to his face and everyone assumes he's always eating? Because he does like the image of the fool being portrayed to people. Oh, I thought he always has crumbs on him because if it's, it'd be one thing if he, does. If he was just hiding oh, in true. his pockets within his sleeves and stuff. Yeah, but, I, could, I could see yeah, how that could true. also, he's faking eating it. But I mean, let's be real. He's yeah. been covered he's, in sweet face. Yeah. With crumbs and spitting stuff out. He's a foodie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wherever food is, he will be. It don't matter. He doesn't seem to be too par. He's partial to pretty much anything, I'm, is what I've gathered from Krupp. With everyone's attention elsewhere, the Mibe edged away from the clearing between two rows of Tist and D tents. Then she spun and tried to run. Bone and muscle protested, even as her veins burned with panic and terror. She hobbled on, half blinded by tears, her breath harsh. Rattling gasps broken by soft whimpers. She thought, oh, dear spirits, look upon me. Show me mercy, I beg you. Look at me stumble and totter. Look, pity me, spirits below. I demand it. Take my soul, you cruel ancestors. I beg you. The copper on her wrists and ankles, minor tribal wards against the aches in her bones, felt cold as ice against her withered skin. The Reavy spirits refused her, mocking, laughing. The Mibe cried out, staggered, fell hard to her knees. The jolt of the impact drove the air from her lungs. Twisting, she sagged to the ground, alone in an alley of dirt. A voice above her murmured, flesh which is the life within. These, cherished friend, are the words of birth, given in so many forms, in countless languages. They are joy and pain, loss and sacrifice. They give voice to the binds of motherhood, and more. They are the binds of life itself. The Mibe raised her head. Crone sat atop a tense ridgepole, her eyes glittered. She said, I am not immune to grief, you see. My dear, tell no one you have seen me so weakened by love. How can I comfort you? The Mibe shook her head and croaked, you cannot. 
Crone said, She is you more than the others, more than the woman Tattersail and Nightchill, more than the Talani Mass. The Mive said, Do you see me, Crone? Do you truly see me? She pushed herself to her hands and knees, then sat back and glared up at Crone. She said, I am not but bones and leather skin. I am not but endless aches, dried brittle, spirits below. Each moment of this life, this terrible existence, and I edge closer to, to, to hatred. She finished in a ragged whisper, then a sob racked her. Crone said, and so you would die now. Yes, I understand. A mother must not be led to hate the child she has birthed. Yet you demand too much of yourself. The Mibe screamed, she has stolen my life. She stared at her fists, eyes wide as if they were seeing a stranger's hands. She softly cried, oh, Crone, she has stolen my life. Crone spread her wings, tilted forward on the pole, then dropped in a smooth curve to thud on the ground before the Mibe. She said, you must speak with her. The Mibe said, I cannot. Crone said, she must be made to understand. The Mibe said, she knows, Crone, she knows. What would you have me do? Ask my daughter to stop growing? This river flows unceasing, unceasing. Crone said, rivers can be damned. Rivers can be diverted. The Mibe said, not this one, Crone. Crone said, I do not accept your words, my love, and I shall find a way. This I swear. The Mibe said, there is no solution. Do not waste your time, my friend. My youth is gone, and it cannot be returned, not by alchemy and not by sorcery. Talon is an unassailable warren, Crone. What it demands cannot be undone. And should you somehow succeed in stopping this flow, what then? You would have me an old woman for decades to come, year after year, trapped within this cage? There is no mercy in that. No, it would be a curse unending. No, leave me be, please. I just had an epiphany. The scene that struck us so in Dead House Gates, when Nil and Nether use the life force of that horse Mm -hmm. to power the charge of the horses up that impossibly steep hill so they could win that battle yes that's effectively the same thing that's happening to the mib right here yeah it's an accelerated of her life force to bring another life force ability to grow faster (laughs) become a woman quicker but it will cost her her life for sure yeah it's just another example of how powerful a life force is in this world yeah agreed footsteps approach from behind a moment later, Corlat lowered herself to the Mibe's side, laid a protective arm around her, and held her close. She murmured, Come, come with me. The Mibe let Corlat help her to her feet. She felt ashamed at her own weakness, but all her defenses had crumbled. Her pride was in tatters, and she felt in her soul nothing but helplessness. She thought, I was a young woman once. What point in raging at the loss? My seasons have tumbled. It is done. And the life within fades, whilst the life beyond flowers. This is a battle no mortal can win, but where, dear spirits, is the gift of death? Why do you forbid me an end? She straightened slightly in Corlat's arms and thought, Very well, then. Since you have already so cursed my soul, the taking of my own life can cause me no greater pain. Very well, dear spirits. I shall give you my answer. I shall defy your plans. The Mibe said, Take me to my tent. Corlat said, No. The Mibe twisted round, glared up at Corlat and said, I said... Corlat interrupted, I heard you, Mibe. Indeed, more than you intended me to hear. The answer is no. I shall remain at your side, and I am not alone in my faith. The Mibe snorted. Faith? You are Tis Dandy. Do you take me for a fool with your claims to faith? Corlat's expression tightened, and she looked away. She said, perhaps you are right. The Mibe thought, oh, Corlat, I am sorry for that. I would take it back, I swear. Corlat continued. Nonetheless, I shall not abandon you to despair. Angry again, the Mibe said, I am familiar with being a prisoner, but I warn you, Corlat, I warn you all. Hatred is finding fertile soil within me, and in your compassion, in your every good intention, you nurture it. I beg you, let me end this. Corlat said, no, and you underestimate our resilience, Mibe. You'll not succeed in turning us away. The Mibe said, then you shall indeed drag me into hatred, and the price will be all I hold dear within me, all that you might have once valued. Corlat asked, you would make our efforts worthless? The Mibe said, not by choice, Corlat, and this is what I am telling you. I have lost all choice, to my daughter and now to you. You will create of me a thing of spite, and I beg you again, if you care for me at all, to let me cease this terrible journey. Corlat said, I'll not give you permission to kill yourself, Mibe. If it must be hate that fuels you, so be it. You are under the care, the guardianship of the Tistandi now. The Mibe sagged, defeated. She struggled to fashion words for the feelings within her, and what came to her left her cold. She thought, self-pity, to this I have fallen. All right, Corlat, 
you've won for now. I'd like to take a moment to discuss this. Okay. They see her suffering. Mm -hmm. It's not like the Malazan religions have some rule against suicide. All the dead are supposed to end up in Hood's realm. So why prolong the issue? Do they think she's simply having a moment of weakness here and she'd change her mind later? I'm assuming why they wouldn't want her to kill herself is it would impact what's going on with Silver Fox. It was stated that way already earlier in this, you know, just a paragraph or so back uh, or a page back on our stuff. You know, it's pretty much what it is. You know, she knows that it's a, it's a river that's st stealing her life from her. She's aware of it. I don't think she can do anything about it. And it's not Silver Fox's fault. This is how she was created kind of deal. But that's really about the all I've got. Because great care was taken to make Silver Fox, especially people like the Tist Andy, who have a longer-lived viewpoint on things, would want to see what goes on. Maybe, I would think. A break seems to want to know what's going to go on with her. Here's why I disagree with that. The two people that are here, Crone's not a person, but the two individuals yes. that are here that profess to care deeply about the Maib, by all accounts, they're friends. Yes. They don't want to see her suffer. Yes. And they want to try and help her the best way they can. I understand the point you're making in that other members of this camp likely want to make sure that Silver Fox is as strong as possible for what's to come. But when it comes to being compassionate towards the Maib, specifically with these two here, I still don't see if she's suffering so badly they're basically just keeping her in an insane asylum in a padded room so she can't kill herself, yeah. but there's nothing they're doing to help her feel better about the situation. I don't know if I agree with that necessarily. I think that Corlat and Crone's compassion, I mean, they want to help her and they're trying to find a way to help her, I feel. Whether they'll be successful or not remains to be seen, but there's something in the Mibes suffering is really speaking to these ladies i'm gonna call crone lady because she's a mother herself <laughs> so it's it, there's something here that's really uh, it's, that hurts them and they want to help the vibe so i don't know if this is if they're aware of everything going on i'm not really sure why they wouldn't want to try and help her like i said i'm not sure how they're they i think they want to make her as comfortable as possible okay so you're saying maybe they think they can find a way to help her in the future they may not have the answer now but hopefully they can later yeah that's what i think they're shooting for <laughs> okay i'll accept that okay <laughs> that makes sense in brood's command tent brood said burn is dying from the sounds in the clearing outside quick ben seemed to have succeeded in pulling the massive wooden card back to the ground and a discussion was underway as to what to do with it. Rake removed his gauntlets, letting them drop to the tabletop before facing Brood. He said, Barring the one thing you must not do, can you do nothing else? Brood shook his head then said, Old choices, friend. Only the one possibility remains, as it always has. I am Tennis, the goddess's own Warren, and what assails her assails me as well. I, I could shatter the one who has so infected her. That is an interesting sentence there. I am Tennis, the mm. goddess's own Warren, and what assails her assails me as well. I wonder why Brood doesn't suffer any of the effects of the sickness that Burn does. Do you think it's the hammer? The hammer is invested by Burn, if I understand correctly. It's like she's poured a lot of herself into this, a lot of her power. Do you think that provides him with some kind of barrier that keeps him from being affected from the cripple god's poison? I don't think so. Because I think he uses that power, mm -hmm. but he also, before he had that power, he's an ascendant. He's been around for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe whatever powers he had beforehand, yeah, I don't know. I still don't see why he wouldn't be in some way affected by it, unless he just isn't drawing from that Warren at all right now. Right. People that powerful may not necessarily need to always be in touch with their Warren. Their millennia of drawing on it has made them just, you know, some kind of, like a battery. You know, they just got enough of it in their cells that they're just, you know, powered up or something. I don't know. I think something is answered a little bit later on here, a little bit, because he does mention something with power. I remember that coming up. Okay. Rake murmured, the crippled god. He has spent an eternity nurturing his spite. He will be without mercy, brood. This is an old tale. We agreed. You, I, the queen of dreams, hood, we all agreed. Brood's broad face seemed on the verge of crumpling. Then he shook himself as would a bear and turned away. He said, almost 1,200 years, this burden. Rake asked, and if she dies? Brood shook his head and said, I do not know. Her warren dies, surely. That at the least, even as it becomes the crippled god's pathway into every other warren, then they all die, Rake said, and with that, all sorcery. Brood nodded, then drew a deep breath and straightened. He said, 
Would that be so bad a thing, do you think? Rake snorted. You assume the destruction would end with that. It seems that no matter which of the two choices is made, the crippled god wins. Brood said, so it seems. Rake said, yet having made your choice, you gift this world and everyone on it with a few more generations of living. Brood said, living and dying, waging wars and unleashing slaughter of dreams, hopes, and tragic ends. Rake said, not a worthy track, these thoughts of yours, Caladan. He stepped closer then said, you have done, you continue to do, all that could be asked of you. We were there to share your burden back then, but it seems we are, each of us, ever drawn away into our own interests, abandoning you. Ouch. He had help, but they left him on his own to deal with this. Yeah. And you know what's funny? I'm sure they probably hung out with him for a while. This is about 1,200 years ago. So this was, I guess, given the hammer. But was it? do you think it was given to him and they were all supposed to kind of function as a team and be like, okay, look, we'll, we'll kind of help you shoulder the burden. And as you said, just after time, they just trickled away, you know, after about a century. Like he even says, our own interest, you know, we left you. Just because we get drawn away into doing something, we'll be, we'll be back. <laughs> and then never come back kind of deal. Yeah, that's messed up. Yeah, that is. I mean, like I said, I'll find it intentional. It's just the fact that they did leave him is kind of sad. It makes me feel bad for Brood, but it makes me realize another thing about the, I forget about the burn stuff. So they were there. Do you think that's when she chained herself? Was when she gave him the hammer and said, okay, I'm going to go to sleep, basically, and see if I can slow this down. I'm not sure how that played out exactly. Whether they chained no. the crippled god, then she realized, oh, now that he's chained, this is going to be a problem. And then so she decides yeah. to go to sleep. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's how it played out or not. Because it had been going on for a long time, because 1,200 years ago is not that long ago compared to 300,000 years ago when they, I'm assuming the initial um, chaining took place the first one, right? <laughs> I think the difference is, let's say you had a canker sore in your mouth. You bit your lip, and mm -hmm. every time you eat, you're constantly in pain because you bit your lip. Yeah, yeah. 300,000 years sounds like a long time, but what if you're in pain or this burden is on your shoulders? and you're suffering the whole time. It becomes a lot longer, right. relatively speaking. So maybe yeah. this last 1,200 years has been absolutely miserable. Well, obviously for Burn, but also Brood, I imagine, is getting, well, he has the moral problem. What yeah. do I do? Do I save Burn or do I kill everybody? That's an issue. Yeah. yeah that's a big and then issue. on top of that, the burden of carrying the hammer. Yeah. It's a big, 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 big responsibility. But also, I imagine it weighs on you. It's similar to Dragnipur. Oh, yeah. It has the same certain heaviness to it, a certain gravity to it. Both of them, they're almost like weird counterparts to each other in a strange way. One, they're not counterparts, but I guess they are kind of counterparts. They're both, they're the only weapons we've seen that there's not a lot of invested things in this universe that we've seen. But we have three. We got the Torx. We got, good gracious, I've, I've, I completely blanked out. So sorry. Dragonfur <laughs> and then the Brood's Hammer. Yeah, there you go. So that's the only one that I can think of. So it doesn't sound like they... Chance was... Oh, Chance was, and that was invested by what Perrin invoked by naming it that he accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> what an accident. Was he prompted by Opon? No, not for that. Not for okay. naming it. He named it years ago. Yeah, that's true. Okay, interesting. Brood said, leave this path, Animander. It avails us nothing. There are more immediate concerns to occupy this rare opportunity to speak in private. Rake gave a thin smile and said, true enough. He glanced over to the tent's entrance, then said, out there. He faced Brood again and went on. Given the infection of tennis, was your challenge a bluff? Brood bared his file teeth and said, somewhat, but not entirely. The question is not my ability to unleash power. It is the nature of that power. Rot through with poison, rife with chaos. And that sounds nasty. Mm. The hammer of chaos. Yeah. And this is what I was talking about. It does hint at the fact that his own power now is actually being frayed up and chewed up with the same poison, I guess, of chaos. When he wields it through the weapon, he doesn't know yes, he's afraid. what form it's going to yeah, take. Yeah, with chaos, it's unexpected. I guess. It's, who knows? It might be all right. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe that also goes back to the point about why he isn't symptomatic, like burn, and he isn't wielding it yeah. in a way. He's not actually channeling power. Yes. So maybe he's not feeling it as acutely as burn is. Yeah, maybe what it is, yeah. It's the only thing I've got. Rake said, meaning it might well be wilder than your usual maelstrom? That is alarming indeed, Brood. <laughs> is Kalor aware of this? Brood said, no. Rake grunted, best keep it that way. 
Brood growled, I. So practice some restraint of your own next time, Rake. Rake walked over to pour himself some wine and said, Odd, I could have sworn I'd just done that. Brood said, We must now speak of the Panion Daman. Rake said, A true mystery indeed, Caladan. Far more insidious than we had surmised. Layers of power, one hidden beneath another, then another. The warren of chaos lies at its heart, I suspect. And the great ravens concur. Brood said, This strides too close a path to the crippled god for it to be accidental, Rake. The chained one's poison is that of chaos, after all. And that's interesting if this theory turns out to be true, if the crippled god is actually behind the Panion Daman's rise. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting indeed. Rake smiled and said, Aye, curious, isn't it? I think there can be no question of who is using whom. Brood said, Maybe. Rake said, Dealing with the Panion Daman will present us with formidable challenges. Brood grimaced and said, As the child insisted, we will need help. Rake frowned and said, Explain, please. Brood said, The Talan I amassed, friend. The undead armies are coming. Rake's face darkened. He asked, Is this Dujek One-Arm's contribution then? Brood said, No, the child, Silver Fox. She is a flesh and blood bone caster, the first in a long, long time. Rake said, Tell me of her. Brood did, at length, and when he was done, there was silence in the tent. I wonder what he said. Another mystery for us. Yeah, I, but at the same time, what's brilliant about this is there's no need to cover that ground again. We've heard. We know. You think so? We know what Brood knows for the most part. He might have some knowledge that we don't know. Oh, I'm sure he has more knowledge than we know. I'm sure. But for the most part, I don't know if it's, uh, I'm just curious what he would liken that to. It's like, I'm, do you think these old fellows are going, you know, it's kind of like that time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, history repeats. About 150,000 years ago. When, you know, it's like, the, you know, exactly. It's yeah, so I can see that. It's the same thing, but they know each other. So they would just have a different way of talking to each other and a longer lifespan to look back on things on is all I was getting at. Yeah, I agree with that. You're probably right. They've probably seen something similar three to five times. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. If not more. Because I mean, this guy's been here for a while. He's been, he's pretty ticked off. I mean, it's like he's, he's earned that right. I mean, let's yeah. just, let, let's just say, let's just call it what it is. He's earned this right to be pretty upset. <laughs> we go to the Malazans. Studying Perrin with hooded eyes, Whiskey Jack strode over. Perrin was trembling, as if gripped by fever. His face bone white and slick with sweat. Quick Ben had somehow managed to lower the tabletop to the ground. Sorcery still wreathed it with dancing lightning that seemed reluctant to fade. Quick Ben had crouched down beside it and Whiskey Jack recognized by his flat expression that the man was in a sorcerous trance. Questing. Probing. Kalor said, you are a fool. Whiskey Jack turned at the rasping words and said, nonetheless, Kalor. Kalor smiled coldly and said, you will come to regret your vow to protect the child. Shrugging, Whiskey Jack turned to resume his walk. Kalor hissed, I am not done with you. Whiskey Jack calmly said, but I am with you and mm. continued on. Wow. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Whiskey Jack is not playing around with Kalor. No, he does not like that old boy. Complete disrespect. Yes. And I love how thoroughly unlikable Kalor is, but I do like him more on this read through. He's way more fun as a villain. Yeah, though at times he's a little much. Oh, For yeah. example when they were all in their standoff last week he's yeah. like which side do you want me on rake it's yes. like calm down, calm down. dude like, calm down <laughs> like, dude, i love it dude i love it oh goodness Perrin was facing whiskey jack now his eyes wide uncomprehending behind him the tistandi had begun to drift away whiskey jack looked for corlat but didn't see her nor he realized after a moment was the mibe anywhere in sight Silver Fox stood a dozen paces from Perrin, watching the captain with Tattersail's eyes. Perrin growled, No questions, as Whiskey Jack halted before him. He went on, I have no answers for you. Not for what's happened here, not for what I've become. Perhaps it would be best if you placed someone else in command of the Bridgeburners. Whiskey Jack said, No reason for that. Besides, I hate changing my mind on anything, Captain. <laughs> I wonder if Perrin's reluctance makes Whiskey Jack more confident that Perrin is the right person in charge of them. Oh, I would think that's a big part of why he trusts Perrin, especially someone that seems to be developing powers. This isn't like, ha ha, I have powers. It's like, no, it's like, oh, he's kind of reluctant. I like that. That makes me really trust him more to figure out what's going on. And I made the right choice. Quick Ben joined them. He grinned and asked, that was close, wasn't it? Whiskey Jack asked, what is that thing? Nodding towards the tabletop. Quick Ben said, just what it appears to be, a new unaligned card in the deck of dragons. Well, it's the unaligned of all unaligneds. The table holds the entire deck, remember? 
Quick Ben glanced over at Perrin and said, the captain here is on the threshold of ascendancy, as we suspected. And that means that what he does or chooses not to do could have profound effects on all of us. The deck of dragons seems to have acquired a master. Genesand rule. Perrin turned away, clearly not wanting to be part of the conversation. Whiskey Jack frowned at Quick Ben and said, Genesand rule. <laughs> I thought that was a name referring to his escapades within a certain weapon. Quick Ben said, it is, but since the name is on the card, it seems the two are linked, somehow. If the captain's in the dark as much as the rest of us, then I'll have to do some hard thinking on what that linkage signifies. Of course, the captain might well know enough to help me along in this, provided he's willing. Perrin opened his mouth for a reply, but Whiskey Jack spoke first. He's got no answers for us, right now. I take it we're carrying that ridiculous table talk along with us on the march? Quick Ben slowly nodded and said, it would be best, at least for a while so I can study it some more. Still, I would advise we unload it before we cross into Panyan territory. The Trigal Trade Guild can deliver it to the alchemist in Darujistan for safekeeping. A new voice cut in. The card does not leave us. The three men turned to find Silver Fox standing close. Behind her, a dozen Reavy warriors were lifting the tabletop. Quickman frowned as he watched the men carry the table away. He said, Risky taking an object of such power into battle, lass. Silver Fox said, We must accept that risk, wizard. Whiskey Jack grunted. Why? She said, because the card belongs to Perrin and he will have need of it. Whiskey Jack asked, can you explain that? She said, we struggle against more than one enemy, as shall be seen. Perrin snapped. I don't want that card. You'd better paint a new face on that thing. I have the blood of a hound of shadow within me. I'm a liability. When will you all see that? Hood knows I do. The rustle of armor alerted them to Kalor's approach. Whiskey Jack scowled. You are not part of this conversation. <laughs> Kalor smiled wryly and said, never part of it, but often the subject of. (laughs) (laughs) This guy with his main Uh, character energy here. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) I love this. I love him. Does that come across as a joke to you? Is this his attempt at humor? It could be. Huh. But I don't take it as such. I don't think this guy actually has a sense of humor. And if it is humorous, it's accidental, probably. Okay. Whiskey Jack said, not this time. Kalor's eyes fixed on Quick Ben and said, You, wizard, are a hoarder of souls. I am a man who releases souls. Shall I break the chains within you? An easy thing to leave you helpless. Interesting that he seems to be able to see something within Quick Ben. What sorcerer's capabilities does Kalor have, I wonder? Well, I'm assuming enough to burn a continent to ash in the prologue. I don't think he did that himself. I think his mages did that on his behalf. Oh, I thought that the mages were calling down the... Cripple God to help fight to kill Kalor. And then I know that the destruction that the Cripple God would have wrought and it's falling to the earth. But Kalor himself said he killed all those people rather than turn it over to them. I don't know how he accomplished that, though. You're, maybe you're right. Maybe he just had them do that. Okay. Yeah, I think a different set of mages called the Cripple okay. God down to try okay. to kill Kalor. But I thought, could be wrong, but I thought he used mages of his own to incinerate the continent because I never see him use sorcery. Yeah. You're right. Not not that I can think of offhand. Uh, I'm curious now if I can find anything about about him because I'm not really sure. Quick Ben replied, even easier to make a hole in the ground. Kalor dropped from sight, the earth gone from beneath him. Armor clattered, followed by a bellow of rage. Silver Fox gasped, eyes widening on Quick Ben. He shrugged and said, you're right. I don't care who or what Kalor is. (laughs) <laughs> it's not just Whiskey Jack. All of the Malazans are disrespecting Kalor, left and right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's truly funny to watch him just diss on him. And I guess this is why he gets this. I'm assuming this leads up to problems in the future because Kalor's probably not going to take this lightly, is he? He's already been slapped by Whiskey Jack. Yeah, he strikes me as somebody that holds grudges for a long time. Yeah. See Night Chill as evidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whiskey Jack stepped to the edge of the pit, glanced down. He said, he's climbing out. Not bad for an old man. Quick Ben hastily added, but since I'm not stupid, I'll take leave now. <laughs> he gestured and seemed to blur a moment before vanishing altogether. Turning his back on the grunting, cursing Kalor, whose gauntleted hands were now visible, scrabbling at the crumbly edge of the pit, Whiskey Jack said to Perrin, return to the bridge burners, Captain. If all goes well, we'll meet again at Kapustan. Perrin said, yes, sir and strode away, somewhat unsteadily. Eyes on Kalor's efforts to extricate himself, Silver Fox said, I suggest we too should depart this particular place. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, agreed, last. 
Man, they just left him there. Amazing. Oh, left him there to crawl out of a hole. I'm curious how deep it was. Yeah, if he climbed out that quick, I, I don't think it was over 10 feet. Nah, he wanted to break a hip for the old fella. <laughs> <laughs> Slumped in his saddle, Whiskey Jack watched the columns of one arms host marching out from the city of Pale. Coral mounted Black Marath circled high above the two decamped armies, fewer in number than was usual. Their achievement, Twist, had departed with Perrin and the Bridgeburners four days ago, and eight of the eleven flights had left in the night just past, on their way to the Vision Mountains on the northwest border of the Daman. Whiskey Jack was exhausted. The ache in his leg was robbing him of sleep, and each day was filled with the demands of supply, details on the planned deployment on the march, and the ceaseless swarm of messengers delivering reports and orders then hurrying off with the same. He was restless to begin the journey across half a continent, if only to answer the thousand questions of what awaited them. Quick Ben sat in silence beside Whiskey Jack, the mage's horse shifting nervously beneath him. Whiskey Jack said, Your mount's picked up on your state of mind, Quick. Quick Ben said, I. Whiskey Jack said, You're wondering when I'll cut you loose so you can chase after and catch up with Perrin and the bridge burners, and put some distance between you and Kalor. You're also eager to get as far away from Silver Fox as you can. Quick Ben started at this last observation, then he sighed. I, I imagine I haven't managed to hide my unease, at least not from you, it's clear. The child's grown five years or more since we arrived, Whiskey Jack. I looked in on the Mibe this morning. Corlat's doing what she can, as are the Reavy shoulder women. But Silver Fox has taken from that old woman almost her entire life force. Hood knows what's keeping her alive. The thought of converging to Lanai Mass ain't making me happy either. And then there's Animander Rake. He wants to know all about me, Whiskey Jack asked. Has he attempted any further probing? Quickman said, not yet, but why tempt him? Whiskey Jack said, I need you for a while longer. Ride with my entourage. We'll keep our distance from the Son of Darkness as best we can. Have those mercenaries in Kapustan taken your bait yet? Quick Ben said, they're playing with it. Whiskey Jack said, we'll wait another week then. If nothing, then off you go. Quick Ben said, yes, sir. Whiskey Jack drawled, now why don't you tell me what else you got going on, Quick Ben? Quick Ben blinked innocently and asked, sir? Whiskey Jack said, you visited every temple and every seer and pale, mage. You spent a small fortune on readers of the deck. Hood, I've had a report of you sacrificing a goat at dawn atop a barrow. <laughs> what in the abyss were you up to with that, Quick? Man, he sees everything. Wow. I'm shocked that he sees all this stuff. That's too funny. I mean, I wouldn't even think he'd be spying. Like, that almost is like spying, but he knows Quick. I don't know, Quick, does, does he always need watching? <laughs> <laughs> Quick Ben muttered, all right, the goat thing stinks of desperation. I admit it. I got carried away. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, oh, wow. and what did those lost spirits in the barrow tell you? Quick Ben said, nothing. There, uh, there weren't any. Whiskey Jack's eyes narrowed. He asked, there weren't any? It was a Reavy barrow, was it not? Quick Ben said, one of the few still remaining in the area. Aye. It was, uh, cleaned out recently. Whiskey Jack asked, cleaned out? Quick Ben said, someone or something gathered them up, sir. Never known that to happen before. It's the strangest thing. Not a single soul remains within those barrows. I mean, where are they? That can't be good. Yeah. Do you think this is why the Reavy spirits don't answer the Mibe? Or are these souls simply the dead in the barrow and the spirits she was praying to or something else entirely? I'm not really sure. I don't really have any thoughts on that, Conron. I had not thought about it. The only thing I had thought about was the spirits that aren't there. I had not really thought about this before on the previous read-throughs, that's for sure. Because I was like, when I saw that, I'm like, oh. Because she does mention that she's, it's like she is in touch with something. I just don't know what. There was a statement when she was having her fit earlier. She said they were laughing at her. And I think that was hyperbolic. Okay. Because she was begging to them to end it, and they were silent. But then okay. I think she said that they were just laughing at her. Earlier in the chapter, the Mibe thought the Reavy spirits refused her and they were mocking her and laughing at her. And I don't know if right. she's being hyperbolic with that or if, in fact, she's hearing somebody mocking and laughing at her for wanting to be done with life because she was begging them to end it. Yeah, I, I know it. Maybe it's, I think, I'm going to go with you. I think that's just hyperbolic. This is just her also just feeling bad and every reason to you know, having her life stolen from her. She's feeling a bit maudlin. She probably feels that people are making fun of her because she was a young, pretty woman just not that long ago, you know? So it's like, uh, it's going to be very hard on her. Man, I don't know who would make fun of somebody like that. It's horrific. No, no, no. I don't think anyone would. I just think that people sometimes think when things are going bad for themselves that people are making fun of you maybe. 
and they're not. You know, she just mm. might think that. And it's not, it's no truth to it. It's just how she feels. Okay. Either way, I think maybe the fact that she's not hearing anything from them, mm-hmm. it m- might be due to this due to being this. cleaned out, possibly. Yeah. That would have a lot to do with it. If there are no ancestral spirits there, <laughs> there's nobody to hear it. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, You're changing the subject, Quick Ben. Nice try. Quick Ben scowled and said, I'm doing some investigating. Nothing I can't handle. And it won't interfere with anything else. Besides, we're now officially on the march, right? Not much I can do out in the middle of nowhere, is there? Besides, I have been sidetracked, sir. Those snatched spirits, someone took them, and it's got me curious. Whiskey Jack said, when you figure it out, you'll let me know, right? Quick Ben said, of course, sir. Whiskey Jack gritted his teeth and said no more. He thought, I've known you too long, Quick Ben. You've stumbled onto something, and it's got you scampering like a stoat with his tail between his legs. Sacrificing a goat for Hood's sake. (laughs) <laughs> on the road from pale one arms host almost 10,000 veterans of the Genebacan campaign moved to join the ranks of Caladan brood's vast army. The March had begun onward to war against an enemy they had never seen and of whom they knew almost nothing. And thus the chapter ends. Mm. That was an eventful chapter. It was the longest chapter that we've covered thus far. I believe yes. of any of the books. Yes. It took us longer to get through any chapter than any before, I believe. I think so. There was so much. My For, word, there was a ton going on. Oh, yeah. For standout moments, I enjoyed Brood asking Perrin to stop the table from spinning in the air. That was hilarious. <laughs> that is amazing. It's always so casual. I always say, and by the way, can you stop that from spinning in the air, dude? <laughs> <laughs> he almost seemed exasperated. <laughs> Man, please. <laughs> Rake's response to Quick Ben's offer to do something about the table. I thought that was interesting and probably oh. brought a little bit more attention than Quick Ben needed from Anamanda Rake. Yes, uh, it was very funny, and I agree. I think it's uh, it's going to uh, make Rake pretty curiouser, curious and curiouser. Mm-hmm. Brood stating that he is tennis. I thought that was quite the statement that that's a very big statement i have to know what that means is he just stating that that's my that's the branch i practice under or is he stating that he is in fact like tennis incarnate are you saying is he like judge dread saying i am the law where the law is actually a thing okay i don't know that seems very egotistical and i don't take brood as being that way no i I agree (laughs) i'm just kind of (laughs) curious Finding out that the other ascendants abandoned Brood to shoulder the burden on his own. Yeah. And again, I think I said this earlier. I, I don't. They did him dirty. Oh, yeah. I, do, I'm not sure if it was intentional or just, you know, our mortals drift a little further away from each other than the regular folks do because they have centuries to get away. Oh, man, it's been like a few centuries since I saw him last. I need to go over and check on him, make sure that fellow's all right, you know. <laughs> well, here's how I look at it. Okay. As a group, they made a decision on how to handle this situation. Yes. And. I assume since he's shouldering the burden, part of that may have been, yeah, we got your back. We'll help you out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, 500 years goes by and all of a sudden it's like, eh, well, you know, I, I kind of got to go deal with something over here. I'm kind of bored or we had a little yeah. bit of a falling out because we argued about this. Now, he, this decision that was made as a group, he's stuck holding the bag. Yeah, that's true. Maybe they didn't like the way he chewed his food for the first 500 years. Like, that guy was driving me nuts. I got to get away from this guy. Just got to get away from this guy. <laughs> the clicking in the jaw every time he does that little move. Oh, it's going to kill him. The noise he makes after he swallows. <laughs> yeah. 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 The way he licks his lip. <laughs> Quick Ben's handling of the Calor situation. Hilarious. <laughs> just dropping him in a hole. That is hilarious, dude. I'm sorry. I love that. that. That's just quick, quick for the comic relief. I just absolutely love it, man. Yeah. You top this whole chapter off with him sacrificing a goat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, I went a little too far that time. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. You got yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> desperate, desperate measures. You know, it's like desperate measures, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great job tonight, Billy. Yeah, thanks, sir. Oh, great chapter. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? No, just like I stated previously, this whole chapter for me is a core memory, and it's a setup for the rest of the book very much as we kind of just all these huge powers that we never came close to anything this big, and powers just kind of chilling 
at the base camp. And all these guys are just all gathered together, hanging out. And, uh, and I love how this is getting laid out. And now it's, you know, now comes the crazy fun that we love Erickson for so much. It's going to get wild. It is. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.